So next we're going to look at a little bit of risk return magic. And what we're talking about is using the capital asset pricing model in order to help us predict some uh, very important relationships. The cap M is a well accepted model, but it is just that it's a model that tries to quantify the risk return trade offs of a stock or portfolio stock compared to the market at, uh, as a whole. So I'm just going to explain it in general terms, just so you understand the concept now, and then we'll do the statistics and math after that. So let's first note that if there's no risk in a stock, then the return is equal to the risk free rate. So that means the market return would exactly equal the risk free rate. Now, you know, that's not true because there's more risk in the market than a U.S. Treasury bill. So then the next part is say, OK, let's say that if I'm buying the market and let's say I buy the entire market, there has to be a premium for me taking on more risk. So that expression could be let's take the risk free rate and that's the, the least you should ever make. And we ought to get a little extra bump. And that bump is the market risk premium over the risk free rate. And so we buy the whole market. We would get a little extra because we took the risk of buying all the market. Now, the third is what happens if you didn't buy the entire market, but you only bought one stock. So if you bought one stock, then we could say, well, what is the amount of risk premium that we deserve for one stock? Now that measure kind of relates the variability of the stock against the market. And that's a little extra bump. So in some stocks, there's high variability, in which case we better get a high uh, premium over the market. Others are pretty stable. So we would expect to get a small, but still some premium over the market. So that relationship we call beta. The risk premium we expect for owning one stock is beta times the market risk premium. What we end up with is this very valuable insight at the very bottom here. And so this is the relationship that we're going to base a lot of what we're going to be doing in the next few steps. And so the risk or the return um, for owning one stock should equal the risk free rate, which everyone should get, plus a premium. The premium is quantified as beta for the stock times the market risk premium for being in the market at all. And that is the return that we re require to own one stock, stock I in this case. So now if we look at a little bit of uh, the magic, we move to portfolios. If we move from one stock to a portfolio, then we could say the standard deviation for the portfolio is equal to, and again, there's a lot of nomenclature here. W here is the weighting of the portfolio times the standard deviation of the market times the beta for stock number one. And so we continue that for stock numbers two, three, four, et cetera, the weighting of that stock times the market variability times the beta for that, that new stock. And we go through all the stocks in the portfolio and all the weighting until we get to 100% of the stocks. So the portfolio beta, you can rearrange the terms as being equal to the weighting of one times beta of one plus the weighting of two times beta of two, et cetera. And we finally end up with this relationship where the rate of return for the portfolio equals the risk free return of the market plus the beta of the portfolio times the market risk premium in general. So you'll notice this is very similar to the one we just did for one stock. So if it's one stock, it's the market risk premium plus beta for that one stock time the market risk premium. If it's a portfolio of stocks, the required return of portfolio equals the risk free rate plus the beta now for the portfolio times the market risk premium. So beta and the rate of return are directly tied. All right. So let's look at how this relates to a new concept that we apply graphically. And that relationship is the security market line. So you notice on the horizontal axis, it is the risk as measured by beta. And on the vertical axis is the required rate of return. And the slope of this line is determined by the market risk premium. In certain times, the premium is quite high, in which case 
There's a steeper slope where we need to be compensated quite a bit more for taking on risk. Other times it flattens, and this is based on market conditions. But this is valuable because if we know the beta for a stock, we can predict what the market should compensate the investor for that amount of risk. So it's kind of a normative graph that it tells you what you should earn given a certain level of beta. And that's how we use it. Let's use Blandy now to go back to cap M and say, well, what is the correlation coefficient, the rho? And that was 0.481. And that's comparing Blandy to the market, right? Earlier we did the rho for Blandy versus Gourmange, but compared to the market is 0.481. And then we can measure beta as equal to the rho times the relative variation of the market and Blandy, and that's 0 0.60. So 0 0.60 is the beta for, for uh, Blandy. So now that we know that, we can then compute what's the expected return if you bought one share of Blandy. So that is the return for one stock, right, Blandy, equals the risk-free rate plus beta for that stock times the market risk premium. So applying that to the Blandy particulars, the risk-free return is 4%. We were given that right here. The beta is 0 0.60, and we computed that here based on the correlation of Blandy to the market and the volatility of Blandy versus the market. And then we multiply that times the market risk premium of 5%, and we end up with this very important result which is if you own one share of Blandy, your required rate of return is 7%. So this is a way that we measure what the market expects to make from a stock. Compare that to last chapter where we were computing or determining by looking at the yield to maturity, what the market demands of a company for a bond. So now we're building up to knowing what is the weighted average cost of capital. Way back when we talked about that, being a blend of what is required return on debt and what's the required return on equity. This is the required return on equity, which is what we just determined. All right, so when we look at the different, um, different betas and different risks, what do we see? We see a couple of examples. Let's say that there's a company with a one beta, which means it moves with the market. So that's simply the risk-free rate plus the market risk premium leading to 9%. Let's say that there's a more volatile stock that would be over one. So a more volatile stock, let's say 1.5, would have a higher rate of return of 10.5. Again, four and five are static. What's moving up is the, is the beta, which cranks up the required return. There are betas that are under one, which means that those stocks are very stable, even more stable than the market generally. So in this case, the illustration, is 0.6, that was Blandy by the way. 0.6 means our market risk premium of five is actually slightly lower for this less volatile stock. And the required return is now 7%. Gourmange has a higher beta, so therefore 10.5 required rate of return. Blandy has a 0.7, which is a lower than even the market rate of return. This illustrates yet again that when we blend portfolios, we actually pick up some uh, different portfolio characteristics given kind of the relative return and the beta of Blandy versus Gourmange. If we do a portfolio, again, we're looking at Blandy's uh, weighting of 70% and we'll use Gourmange at weighting of 30. And if we do so, we could get a portfolio beta. And we're simply using this percentage here as the weighting of the beta. So if Blandy has a beta of 0.6 and Gourmange has a, has a beta of 1.3, the weighting based on the relative proportions in the portfolio for those two lead to a portfolio beta of, of 0.81 right here, all right? And so if we had a portfolio with a beta of 0.81, we can actually figure out what is the required return on that portfolio. And so we use the same thing we've been using, the risk-free rate of 4% plus the beta, this time of the portfolio of 0.81, mark risk premium of five. And so again, this significant result is that we expect to make 8.05% 
in this portfolio that's comprised of seventy percent blandy and thirty percent gourmand.